Okay, welcome to um, Research Methods, Psych 200. Okay, um, on Monday we talked about uh, the survey. Okay, so we were, this um, chapter is on uh, descriptive research and um, we talked about the survey on Monday. Today we're talking about observational research, observations, okay, and case studies. <clears throat> so let's get right to that. So we're talking about the observational research design. What is observational research? It sounds simple, but it's actually complicated, okay? <clears throat> Observational research is research in which the, uh, well, the researcher, the person conducting the study, observes, okay? Observes and systematically records the behavior of individuals to describe behavior, okay? Uh, what that really means is that for observational research, you observe and you record, that's what you do. Another way of saying that is you watch people and you measure, okay? That's the same thing. You observe and you, you, you record what you're looking at, okay? Results are, <clears throat> are used simply to describe the variables being, variables being studied, okay? Um, it, this is just descriptive research. You're just trying to describe what's there, okay? It's not an experiment, okay? Uh, you're not gonna be doing anything like that, okay? We haven't talked about experiments, that'll be later, but you're just going to observe and measure, that's it. You're gonna describe what is there, <clears throat> and that's about it. <clears throat> Sounds simple, but that's just the definition. In practice, it's a bit more complicated, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, there are issues with measurement. Measurement problems that you can have with uh, an observation. Actually, it says there behavioral observation. There are uh, several kinds of observations, <clears throat> but they're observations nonetheless. Behavioral observation, is you observe behavior, okay? There's also a naturalistic observation in which you observe behavior in the real world, which could still be a behavioral observation. So it's just an observation, okay? So that's what you do when you do an observation. You observe behavior, okay? You don't observe emotions or thinking. You can't really see that, so it's behavior that you focus on. So they're often just called behavioral observations. Okay, so what are two measurement problems that you might have when you do an observation? Well, one thing, one issue is that it is essential that the behaviors are not disrupted or influenced by the presence of an observer, okay? Uh, you have to be careful that when you do an observation that you do not influence the behavior that you are observing, that you do not impact it in some way. You want to observe real behavior, okay? Natural behavior. And if you influence it in some way, <clears throat> then you're changing it, and then it's no longer valid. Okay, if you do influence the behavior, that raises the question of demand characteristics and reactivity. Demand characteristics, so let's say you're watching people, let's say children playing, okay, but they notice that you're observing them and therefore you influence them. And what do children know when you're watching them? They play nicer, okay, that's demand. They're showing you what they think you want them to see. I mean, they, they're showing you what you want to see, basically. That's what they're doing. Same thing could happen if you're observing other situations. People tend to behave themselves when you're watching them. That's demand, okay? That's not the real behavior. And reactivity, okay? <clears throat> they may behave differently. That's all that means, right? They may behave differently. They may react in some way because you, they know you're observing things. So if you influence them, you're going to change the behavior. So that's one problem. And another problem is the, that the, obje the observations are based in part on subjective judgment. In other words, you're watching, right? You're watching, you're observing, and what you are recording is based on what you think is happening. It is subjective, okay? You are observing what you think you see. But as you know, people tend to see things in different ways, and people tend to interpret things in different ways. So that's also a problem, okay? You may see what you think is happening, but somebody else might think that there's something else that is actually happening, okay? Just like, you know, during a, a debate, okay? You have the Democratic candidate, the Republican candidate, you have people observing, and the, almost always, the Republican observers will almost always say, oh, that the Republican did a good job, but not the Democratic candidate. He said some things that were just awful and wrong. The Democratic observers will say the complete opposite that the Democrat did a better job and that the Republican said some things that weren't good. That's always what happens. That's subjective judgment, okay? We are all biased. 
We all see the world in our own unique way. And that's a problem for observations. Okay, but there's a way to deal with that. We'll talk about it. I do know that sometimes I tend to speak quickly, but remember this is being recorded, so you can slow it down and uh, watch it again if you need to. And when I get excited, sometimes I speak a little bit more quickly. All right, <clears throat> I'm usually excited. I like research, okay. Um, <clears throat> how do you address these measurement problems? Uh, the first problem where you can influence, you know, the, um, the behavior of uh, those you are observing can be addressed by concealing the observer. In other words, you can hide, okay? Or, you know, do something so they don't really notice you, okay? You can actually hide, you know, like behind something so they don't see you. That's one way to do it. Or you can just basically what is hide in what is called plain sight. You can be sitting there, you know, or standing there, and there's other people there, and you just pretend you're minding your own business and you're not watching anybody, okay? You are still concealed to some extent. <clears throat> Alternatively, participants can become habituated to the observer's presence. Even if they can see you, <clears throat> okay, if you observe over time, they get habituated, they get used to you. And then when they get used to you, they behave more naturally. Okay, this requires repeated exposure, okay, until the observer's present is no longer a novel stimulus. So if they see you over and over again, after a while, they start being themselves. Uh, just like when you teach a class, when you first start, the students aren't used to you, they're kind of quiet, right? Let's consider that, let's say it's little kids, right? The teacher is teaching little kids, right? At the beginning, they don't know what to think of you. They're kind of quiet, they're well behaved. As they get used to you as the teacher, they start being themselves and then they start acting up. That's what happens. With repeated exposure, people become habituated and then they behave more naturally. And this makes it possible that you can actually do an observation in somebody's home, let's say. You would have to get permission for that, but let's say you wanna, you wanna watch uh, parent-child interactions <clears throat> and you get permission to observe people in their own home, okay? Um, maybe you can do it by, ac by actually sitting there, or uh, more likely, you can probably, let's say, put a camera in there. If you get permission to put a camera in there, obviously not in the bathroom, okay, or, or, or the bedroom or anything like that, but maybe in the living room so you can watch these interactions. And at first, they're going to behave themselves because that camera is there. They know people are watching them. But over time, they will, be, they will start behaving like themselves. That's what happens with repeated exposure. They become habituated. It happens naturally, okay? The second problem where... Ob observers have their own subjective interpretation, you know, that problem where everyone sees the world in their own unique way, so to speak, that can be addressed by using what's called inter-rater reliability. The inter-rater reliability method is a method where you just use multiple observers. You have two or three people observing the same situation and they all record what they think they see. Afterward, you can check and determine the degree to which these observations are basically the same, to the extent to which they agree on what they see. You check the reliability. And the, by the way, that's done with correlation, okay? And if you see that there's high reliability, that basically that there's a high degree of correlation between different observers, that means that probably is what is going on and that's more valid, okay? So you check the reliability, right? <clears throat> the extent to which there's agreement. And if there's agreement, then that means you're probably seeing what is actually there. So that also helps you with validity. Let's keep going. More about uh, uh, addressing subjective interpretations. Uh, another thing you can do to uh, address the, what are called these subjective interpretations, the fact that people tend to see and record things in their own way. Another thing you can do, and this is what is frequently done, this is just the way it's done, okay? is to basically standardize the observation, okay? In order to do that, what you do is you need to come up with a list of well-defined categories of behavior. So if you're looking for, let's say, aggressive behavior, then you need to determine ahead of time what aggressive behavior is and what counts as aggressive behavior. You need to come up with those behavior categories. Or maybe you're observing play behavior and you're gonna be watching group play, you know, playing alone, aggression, social interaction, right? You're gonna be watching all those things. 
you need to define those things ahead of time, okay? <clears throat> and come up with examples of each one. So you're actually going to have a sheet of paper with a list of things. And when you see those things, you can record them, okay? That is um, a way to uh, minimize that subjectivity. In other words, basically, what you are looking for is defined, and if you see it, you record it, okay? That makes it less likely that people are just gonna record whatever they think aggression is. No, it's been defined ahead of time. This is what aggression is. If you see this, this, or this, then you record it. Not bait, it's not just based on what you think is happening, okay? <clears throat> so you come up with a list of categories, list of behavior categories. Think of it this way. It's kind of like a survey, but instead of them filling it out themselves, you're filling it out for them as you watch them. Okay, it's kind of like that. Not exactly the same, but it's similar to that. And you list exactly, I said this already, but you list when you come, after you come up with these categories of behavior, what is group play, what is playing alone, what is aggression, what is social interaction, you list exactly which behaviors count as an example of each category. So like I said, you come up with examples of each. Okay, and this provides a clear operational definition of each construct being observed. All right, this clearly defines uh, what it is that you're looking for. And it clearly defines what it is, okay? So when you see it, you record it. Let's keep going. <clears throat> now here's where it gets a little bit complicated. You have to quantify your observations. When you're observing, okay, um, you have to determine, you know, well, what are you gonna record, okay? Are you just gonna list the things that you see? or check them off. Uh, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. You have to actually convert what you see into numbers. And that, that's what it means to quantify observations. So quantifying observations means you convert your observations into numerical scores. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated. It's not because of math or anything like that. It's just, there are a lot of options here, okay? There's three techniques that are used to quantify behavioral observations. Three things you can do, three techniques for turning these observations into numbers. One is simply to use the frequency method. That one is simple. Uh, all you do is you count how many times you see that specific behavior. And here's some examples for you guys. So you basically <clears throat> count the number of aggressive acts, you know, dirty, during a 30 minute period, during the time which you observe, right? How many times uh, did the participant behave aggressively, okay? And here's another example for you guys that's based on research. Did you know that half of American teenagers ages 12 to 17 send 50 or more text messages a day? And a third of them send more than 100. That's an example. I did that with an observation. They watched them and they counted how many times these teenagers are texting. That's the frequency method. And in a day, it turns out that half of them send 50 or more text messages, and a third of them send more than 100. In other words, teenagers are texting all the time. Now, I am, you know, I grew up at a different time where we just talked on the phone. We didn't text. And I, I text now, but I'm not like a teenager that does it constantly. There's something about teenagers and texting. And that's what that observation showed, right? And that's interesting, the fact that that does happen. And luckily now we have these cell phone plans or the, these phone plans, right, uh, <clears throat> that have unlimited texting. Now I can tell you I'm old enough to remember when this texting stuff started and they used to charge you per freaking text back then, per text, something like 50 cents per text. And it would get out of hand when you had these teenagers sending all these bunch of texts every day, you get hit with a huge bill. Luckily that has changed, right? But at the beginning, yes, the phone companies, they wanted to charge you per text. They wanted to charge you per minute of using the, the internet, believe it or not. Now everything's unlimited, right? Because it makes more sense. Otherwise they end up gouging you and charging you a bunch of money because you spend a lot of time on the internet, you spend a lot of time sending texts, and that's ridiculous. They're gonna charge you per minute per text or something like that. But that's an example of the frequency method, okay? Another thing you can do is use what's called the duration method. It's a fixed time observation. In other words, what you do, let me explain that. What you're doing is you record how long something happens. That's the duration method. So for example, okay, during a period of time that you observe, during a 30 minute period, 18, for 18 of those minutes, 
uh, this child was playing alone. And maybe the other 12 minutes, the child was playing in a group. That's the duration method. All you're doing is recording how long something happens. How long do they play alone? Or how long do they play in a group? How long did the aggressive behavior last, right? That's the duration method. So the frequency method, the duration method, and you also have the interval method, which is a little bit more complicated. With the interval method, you divide the observation into a series of intervals. So you divide the observation into a series of equal times, okay? And then you record behavior during each interval. <clears throat> so an example here, you can divide the observation into 30 one minute intervals, right? And then you observe how often something happens during those 31 minute intervals, okay? So dur during those 31 minute intervals, the child played in the group during 12 of those intervals. So what you're doing here is you're balancing the frequency and duration methods for a more representative measurement. You're combining the frequency and duration method. You're breaking up the observation into equal time intervals, and then you're measuring how often something happens during that time. So it's a combination of the frequency and duration method. It's called the interval method. So you can see already that observations are not as simple as they seem. And it's going to get even more complicated, OK? So I don't recommend you do an observation. Maybe you'll learn how to do one in graduate school if you go to graduate school. And then you'll get good at them, OK? And you'll know what you're doing. But right now, we're just talking about them. You need to know a little bit about them. Another situation comes up when you observe a situation, well, when you observe observation, when you do observations that are complex. See, in the real world, there's complexity, OK? What you have is multiple things happening at the same time. You're trying to do an observation, and in reality, it's not one little thing that is happening. It's not one child over here playing. It's not one situation over here. There's a bunch of things happening at the same time. So the real world is complex. So what do you do? when you have these complex situations, right? You wanna observe complex situations, or that's just what's gonna happen. It can be impossible to observe many individuals and many behaviors simultaneously. Many individuals doing many different things, right? Many situations at the same time. How the heck do you observe that? When you observe one situation, you miss the other one. You observe this one individual, you miss the other ones, right? One solution, the easiest solution, is to just record the situation. Have a camera there and record the situation, and then you can replay it later on. You can replay it as many times as you want. You can replay it and watch this individual, and then you can rewind. Let's watch this individual now. You can, re you can rewind and say, okay, let's watch this situation over here. Let's watch this other one over here, right? And you can spend a long time, uh, you know, recording what was there because you play it over and over again. But you can't really do that if you don't record it. And by the way, when you do record things, if you're recording a private setting, a private situation, like let's say, you know, in a restaurant or in somebody's home, you have to get permission for that. But if you're recording out there in public, right, uh, then, you know, you can record, okay? Like out in public. Uh, but even then, there might be a situation where you might have to blur people's faces if you're going to, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't be post these, posting these on YouTube, okay? But people do record things and they, they do post them on YouTube, but uh, there's privacy issues, okay? But yes, in public, you're allowed to record, but there are still some issues. And I'm not an expert on these privacy issues, but yeah, one solution is to record, assuming that it's okay to do so. A second solution, okay, is that you can take a sample of observations rather than attempt to record everything you can sample. In other words, you can observe some things and not others. Some people and not others. That's sampling, okay? Just like when you sample, when you do a survey, you select some people and not others, okay? Or you do an experiment. Some people are part of it, some people are not. That's sampling. Not everyone can be observed, not everyone can be recorded, okay? So you take a sample of observations, and there's three ways to do this. Time sampling, event sampling, individual sampling. Like I told you guys, observations get a little complicated. There's a lot of options here. Not a lot, but when you look at it as a whole, uh, they're not as easy as you may think. So when sampling observations, so first you need to divide the observation into a series of time intervals, okay? So you need to divide them into a series of equal time intervals, 10 minute intervals, 20 minute intervals, or whatever it is. 
And then after that, you can use either time sampling, event sampling, or individual sampling, okay? Time sampling is when you record for one period of time, one interval. I mean, not when you record. When you observe for one period of, uh, of time, one time interval, right? Then you pause to record. You pause and you record what you found. You write it down or you record it, right? And then after that, you observe again for uh, you know the se second time interval, equal time interval, and then you stop and record again. And then you observe again, then you record, right? That's time sampling. Event sampling <clears throat> is when you identify one event or one behavior to be observed during the first interval and you use a different event during the second interval. So remember, you break up the observations into a series of time intervals. So maybe during the first five minutes, right, you observe this one event happening over here. Maybe there's a guy talking to some girl over here. You observe that and you record, right? And then during the second time interval, you deserve to watch this other couple over here. Or there's other situation over here where people are fighting or something. You observe that and you record. And then another situation, that's event sampling, right? You are basically sampling events or situations. And then there's individual sampling, where you observe this one person over here first and record, right, during that first interval. The second interval, you observe this other person. Third interval, this other one over here, right, and so forth. That's what we mean. And you can see there's some overlap, okay? Yes, some, when you're watching an event sometimes, you know, that of course can include people, okay? But if it's an event, if it's a situation, right, where it's a fight, you know, or let's say it's a conversation or, or somebody dancing or drinking, then that's an event. If you're just focusing on the individual and not what, you know, not the actual event, right, that's individual sampling. But yes, there is overlap. I understand that. Okay. That was the observation. That's some information on how you do an observation. And I know that wasn't simple, okay? Now, there are other things that you can do uh, that uh, are related, that go by slightly different things, okay? You may not have heard about this, but you can also do something called a content analysis. A content analysis uses the techniques of a behavioral observation. A content analysis is when you analyze the content of something. It's not a real observation in which you're observing people. A content analysis is something you could do, for instance, for a movie. You can analyze a movie. And when you do that, guess what? You're going to use the same techniques as you do for an observation. You're going to watch these individuals over here, this event over here, you know, time sampling, event sampling, whatever it is, frequency, duration you know, interval method, right? You use the same rules, the same, the same techniques to analyze that movie. It's like a situation, it's like, it's like an observation. Or you can analyze a, a book, a play, a poem. That is content analysis, right? So you can measure the, so here are some things you can do. You can measure the occurrence of specific events in literature, right? In books, right? in plays, in poems, right? In movies, TV programs, similar media, right? Um, representing replicas of behavior. So in other words, those are replicas of behavior. It's like somebody wrote about something, somebody filmed something, you know, you can do the same thing that you do with, a, with an observation, with a behavior observation. You use the same rules. An example would be the number of aggressive acts in Saturday morning cartoons. All right, now we don't really, I don't know how many of you watch public television and I don't even know if there, if there even are Saturday cartoons anymore. Okay, doesn't have to be Saturday cartoons. Okay, just cartoons in general. You know these kids' cartoons, right? I don't even, they're not even called cartoons anymore. They're called animations, okay? These, these things that kids like to watch, the animation, whether you're talking about The Simpsons, The Simpsons, okay, I know it's really old. Okay, I'm showing my age here. But uh, anything else that might be uh, popular, Maybe you're watching My Little Pony or something like that, or I, I know that's old too, but um, you know, I don't really watch this stuff, so I don't know, really know what's current. I, my kids watch several things, but they watch a bunch of things. I'm not really sure, okay? I can't think of anything right now. But you watch some, you know, some animation, right? That's meant for children. 
you can do an, uh, a behavior observation on that. You can actually, it's not called a behavior observation, it's called a content analysis. You can do a content analysis and analyze the content and you might find, you know, that there's a bunch of aggressive acts in that programming. And that used to be uh, very true, by the way, that, you know, children's cartoons, you know, when I grew up, you know, whether it was Bugs Bunny or it was the Transformers, you know, I, I'm, I'm old, okay? I'm, I'm like, you know, probably at least 20 years older than you guys, okay? Um, you know, all those things you used to watch, uh, Tom and Jerry, um, there was a bunch of aggression in that stuff. They'd shoot each other, blow each other up, beat each other up. Somehow no one ever got killed, right? That didn't happen, but there was a bunch of aggression. And there were complaints that, uh, you know, from researchers, you know, and parents that, hey, you know, you're teaching children to be aggressive. Can't you guys produce something that's better for children? And nowadays they do. Now children's programming is a lot better, by the way. But the stuff for teenagers is still awful, okay? If you're a teenager, you're watching really awful stuff, okay? <laughs> because teenagers tend to want to watch stuff that's meant for grown-ups. That's what happens. Little kids want to watch the stuff that's actually, you know, really for teenagers, right? And it's not that bad. And then the teenagers want to watch the stuff that's for grown-ups. So my daughter watches shows about teenagers going to school and having their friends and their little dramas, even though she's not a teenager, right? And she watches stuff like that in her cartoons, her animations. It's about that kind of stuff. And it's not so bad. But the teenagers aren't watching that stuff. That's lame for teenagers. Teenagers are watching the stuff that's actually meant for adults. The cartoons or the animations meant for adults and the movies for adults, and those are really violent. You can do a content analysis on the Bible. You think there isn't a lot of death and destruction and sex in the Bible? Do a content analysis, although that would probably take years. It's a really huge book. Uh, I forget how many pages, but there might be thousands of, yeah, thousands of pages in there. You can do a content analysis and you'd be surprised how much death and destruction and gore and sex is in there? That's not what you hear at church. If you've read it yourself, especially if you read it from cover to cover, you've seen those things. There's some horrific things described in there. Things you wouldn't want to tell your kids about. Or even your teenagers. They're not ready for that stuff, okay? In any book, actually. You can do a content analysis, let's say, on some play. And based on what you find about the play, uh, you can probably determine, you know what, this was probably written by Shakespeare because it's similar to other Shakespeare plays. There are some plays or some things that were written where there is no author. They don't know who the author is. They can do a content analysis and try to figure out which author most closely matches, you know, based on their work, based on other work that you've also analyzed. So that's content analysis. I've said way too much about that, okay? Um, let's keep going. Um, there's also um, archival research. With archival research, uh, you look at historical records, ar archives. Archival research, you look at things that are already recorded. You know, lots of things are already recorded. Uh, people join the military and there's a bunch of records. People go to the doctor, the hospital. There's a bunch of records there. People go to school. People get arrested. People get married. People buy homes. Guess what? All this stuff is recorded. Okay, so with archival research, it measures behaviors or events that occurred in the past, things that have already happened. They're recorded. They are public records, or sometimes they're not public records, but they're records, and they're recorded somewhere. And if you can get access to them, you can analyze that. And when you do uh, archival research, when you analyze that research that's already recorded, right, um, you can find lots of things. One interesting study found that uh, people marry individuals whose last names resemble their own. People tend to marry others with similar last names. Not everyone, but they do. And what that probably means is this. If you're Jewish, you probably marry another Jewish person. If you're Latino, most likely you're marrying another Latino. White people, more, more likely another white person. There are people who marry people who are very different with different last names. It might be a Jewish person who marries a Latino here and there or maybe even a Muslim, right? There might be a Latino who marries a white person or a black person who marries a white person, et cetera, right? Or an Asian person who marries a white person. That happens too. But for the most part, people marry others who have names, last names, or are similar to their own. And that basically means they're probably from the same culture. That's probably what that means. 
archival research tells you a whole bunch of things, you know? Archival research can tell you basically, you know, when people die on average, you know? It, it tells you how often people go to the hospital, who's more likely to get kicked out of the military, all sorts of things, okay? That's archival research. You basically look at things that are already recorded. And it's kind of like doing an observation. Content and archival research rules for measurement. So with content and archival research, uh, the measurement that you use follows the same rules that you use for behavioral observation. I told you guys that already, but yes, you use the same rules, the ones we just talked about. You establish those categories, and then you use the frequency method, the duration method, the interval method for obtaining the numerical scores, right? You could also use, use uh, you know, time sampling, event sampling, individual sampling, right? You can use multiple observers for at least part of the measurement process to obtain a measure of interrate or reliability. You can use multiple observers. You can have more than one person, let's say, uh, do a content analysis on the Bible. And then you check the extent to which they agree. Because maybe that one person is not a Christian, let's say, and he's gonna say some mean things. And this other person is, or whatever it is. You can have multiple people you know, do a content analysis in the same book and see the extent to which they agree. And if they agree, then there probably is something to it. But go ahead, look at it yourself. You'll see there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, there's stuff in there that would give you nightmares. It's described in such detail. So awful. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying the book itself is awful, by the way, but there's a lot of things in there that will shock you and that will just scare you when you read about them. Okay things that you didn't think people were capable of are described in there. Things I have never heard of. The most violent, uh, just scary stuff is in there, okay? Um, but you can determine from um, multiple observers, right? Multiple people doing the content analysis or the archival research. If there's some agreement, then there's more likely to be the case that that's actually what is in there. It's actually what is happening. Um, there's different types of naturalistic observation. So we talked about the behavioral observation, which is just an observation, okay? You observe behavior. You can't really observe other things. You have to observe what you can see, and that's behavior. But you can also call an observation a naturalistic observation, okay? And with a naturalistic observation, uh, there's no intervention of the researcher. In other words, the researcher should not influence the situation. We talked about that already. That's just the way you do an observation. So whether you call it a behavioral observation, naturalistic observation, may actually, or just an observation, it might actually be the same thing. But there are different kinds, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about some that are a little bit different. But the first type, the type you always hear about, it's a naturalistic observation. It's often just called an observation or a behavioral observation. It's the same thing. But the researcher doesn't interfere, doesn't intervene, doesn't try to change the behavior in any way. So an example, you can observe children in the playground, right? Watch them play. Observations, this type of observations have a high degree of external validity. And what that means is that uh, you can generalize your findings. You're watching real behavior in the real world. So you can generalize. If you have external validity, that means that what you found, you can generalize to the real world. So you did a study. And based on this study, you know what's happening out there. That is external validity. It's also called generalizability. It's the same thing. You might have heard it of, as just generalizability in Psych 101. It's also called external validity. That means it has validity out there externally. Um, you can observe uh, variables that cannot be manipulated for ethical reasons. You can do observations on things that you can't just, you can't do an experiment on. Spanking, you can't do an experiment on spanking. Are you really gonna take some kids, spank them, and then have some kids that you don't spank and see which children you know, respond better? You can't do that, that's not allowed. But you can observe, you can do observations, and you can watch parents spanking their kids, and you can watch parents who don't spank their kids, but you can't do it yourself. You can't do a study on that. I mean, uh, an experiment on that, but you can do an observation, okay? Uh, limitations of observations they can be time consuming. They take a long time. You're, you're not just gonna observe for 30 minutes and you're done. You're gonna observe for hours, day after day, week after week. 
who knows, maybe for months, right? And you can interfere or influence the situation without even intending to, sometimes that happens. And if that happens, then you kind of ruined it. And you have to start again, okay? Or find another situation to observe, another person. There are other types of observations you may not have heard about. There's also the participant observation. The participant observation is where the researcher actually interacts with participants and becomes one of them. In the naturalistic observation, no, you don't interfere. In this one, you do. Participant observation, the researcher interacts with participants and becomes one of them. An example of that would be Ro Rowan Hand's 1973 study or research investigating patient staff interactions in psychiatric hospitals. Here's what Rowan Hand did. He had eight individuals. You know, they were probably, you know, just, you know, there's a whole team of people that does the research, okay? These are probably graduate students or something like that. Eight individuals that pretended to hear voices so that they can be admitted into that institution. They pretended that they heard voices, they were schizophrenic, so they can be admitted into that psychiatric hospital, that psychiatric institution. And then they were in there pretending to see how the staff treated them. There's, there was a lot of horrible stuff that was done to patients back in the past. We, uh, we treated patients horribly, not me, but you know, the people back then, they really weren't, didn't know how to treat these people very well. So they did some very old, awful stuff. They deprived them of things, they, they, they tied them up, they kept them in chains. It was awful, some of the things they did. Unnecessary surgery, uh, drugging them. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, these individuals right here pretended to hear voices so they could be admitted and then find out what was going on. There was a study about that. Not sure if it was specifically about determining if there was abuse or bad things going on in there, but they wanted to know, you know, I guess what treatment was like. An advantage of doing this kind of observation is that it has a high degree of external validity. Again, you can really generalize, okay? Because again, it's real behavior that you're out there observing in the real world. I know the people are pretending, but they're observing the interactions. They're observing what goes on in there. And if they are believed, right? If they believe that they're really mentally ill and they're treated a certain way, then they know that's really what happens. There are limitations, there are problems. It's very time consuming, just like all naturalistic observations, right? It can be dangerous. You know, hey, you pretend to be one of them, right? And you're in there and, you know, you get beaten or abused or, you know, drugged or whatever it is. That it can be very dangerous, right? It can alter the participant's behavior as well. After, you know, it is possible that the uh, the participants, right, uh, who are, who you're trying to observe and the staff, you know, are, you know, that you affect them and then they may not behave naturally. The observer may lose objectivity. Um, the observer can be so immersed in the situation that after a while they forget, you know, that, uh, well, they lose track of what's real and what's not real. And they may forget that, you know, that this is, a, you know, a a study, okay? And sometimes they, well, sometimes they, well, I don't really know how it happens, but sometimes they actually get lost in there and they are uh, stuck in there and then they behave as if they're really mentally ill or imprisoned or something like that. Um, that can happen. Um, another example of this might be if you heard of, uh, what's her name? Um, ah, Jane Goodall. She did a, uh, she kind of did, she did a naturalistic observation. She observed behavior in the real world, the behavior of gorillas though, but she did a participant observation. She became kind of like one of them. She uh, watched them for a long time. The gorillas saw her and after a while they became comfortable with her. And it's like they accepted her as part of the family of gorillas. And then she was able to observe them up close. So that's kind of like participant observation and naturalistic observation all at once. Let's keep going. There's also what's called a uh, contrived observation. I might have spelled contrived incorrectly, I'm not sure. But a contrived observation where the researcher sets up a situation likely to produce the desired behavior of participants and participants, okay? Uh, you set up a situation to make things happen. Like parent-child interactions in the laboratory. Uh, you guys might remember, some of you, um, 
maybe you haven't heard, maybe some of you haven't heard, but uh, uh, Mary Ainsworth and the strange situation. She observed infants interacting with their mothers, for the most part, with their mothers. And she set up, uh, you know, a contrived observation, a room with a rug and some toys where the mother and the child could interact and play. And she observed them. And there was a situation where a stranger would walk in, a stranger would leave, mommy would leave, mommy would come back. So things were set up, right? So certain things would happen. And then, you know, the researchers observed to see how the child and the parent kind of, you know, related to one another. That's a contrived observation. The advantage, you do not have to wait for the behavior to occur naturally. You can make it happen. You can make a stranger walk in and see how the child reacts. Have mommy leave, how, see how the child, you know, reacts, okay? Limitation, the environment is less natural, right? It's contrived, it's fake. You, may, you can make it look more natural, but it's still not natural. So the behavior may not behave naturally. It's still a strange setting. It's still not the child's home. The child's not used to it. The child may not behave naturally if we're talking about parent-child interactions. Okay, you can try to make something look like a real, you know, bar or a real situation in the real world, but it's still not going to seem completely natural. Okay, let's keep going. Strengths and weaknesses of, of the observation, research design. Okay, we just talked about them, so I'm not going to go over that, but I'll leave that there for you guys so you can look at it yourself. If, you know, you want to sum things up, look at them as in an outline. Um, one more type of study we need to talk about, and uh, that's a case study, the case study design. You probably remember case studies from 101. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more, okay? Uh, but not a whole lot more. With a case study, a case study is an in-depth study or you know, a detailed description basically of a single individual or a group. It could also be a specimen, but basically it usually means the study of a single individual. In a case study, the information can be obtained from an interview. You can interview the person, right? You can interview relatives, observations, you can survey the person, you can look at archival data. So with a case study, you can use a variety of methods. Survey the person, ask questions, observe them, talk to their relatives to get secondhand information. You can run tests, you can do all sorts of things, but you focus on one person. It may involve intervention or treatment that's administered by the researcher, okay? Um, you know, yeah, in the case study, sometimes you prescribe a treatment, you know, it could be a type of therapy or a drug and see how the individual then uh, responds to that. And that's often what is done by, you know, psychiatrists or uh, let's say uh, clinical psychologists, therapists, right? They may study one person in detail. They prescribe some kind of medication or they try some therapy and then they record and see what happens. It's a case study. They're still studying one individual in depth, okay? Um, in clinical cases, the report contains detailed description of observations, experiences, diagnosis, and treatment individual. When you prescribe treatment intervention, right, that's called a clinical case, a clinical case study, right? So the report contains, you know, description of, you know, observations, the way the participant seems to be, right? It could be a lot of things, the way they tend to talk, the way they carry themselves, their tone of voice, their posture, lots of different things. Um, detailed uh, report of their experiences, maybe that you got through an interview or a survey. Uh, diagnosis, right? You know, diagnosis, you, you know, if you believe they're suffering from depression or something else. And even treatment, prescribe some kind of treatment and, you know, you record how the individual progresses. That would be a clinical case study. Now, there's also something known as a case history. A case history is a type of case study. A case history is a case study without any treatment or intervention. So when, you, when we actually talk about a, uh, a case study, usually what we're talking about is a case history. If it's something that involves treatment, that's a clinical case study, okay? But a case history is when there's no treatment. So a case history can, you know, basically record uh, personal information, medical information about their medical condition, medication that uh, has been used, on, and special conditions of the individual, right? Uh, medication that they use, you didn't prescribe it for them, okay? You didn't prescribe the medication. You just record if they're on medication, okay? Or if they're undergoing something, okay? 
things that they're already taking themselves, okay, or undergoing themselves. And you're just reporting on what you found through your observations, you're surveying them, you're interviewing them, uh, testing them, but you don't prescribe medication yourself. You don't prescribe treatment yourself. That would be called the case history. You're basically just uh, uncovering their history, what they've been through. Okay, that's a case history. Um, applications of the case study design. What can you use a case study for? You can study rare phenomena. You can study things that don't happen that often, things that are unusual. Okay, you can get information about mental disorders such as multiple personality disorder, right? You can't really do an, uh, you know, um, you can't really make that happen. It's not that common. But if you find someone who has it, you can study that one individual in depth. You're not going to be able to find a bunch of people who have that, but you might be able to find one or two people, but you can study one person in depth. You can study individuals with brain injuries and their underlying neurological mechanisms, right? You can study someone that has a certain kind of brain injury and, uh, you know, determine what they're like, okay? Or if you actually look at their brain, if you're allowed to do that, right? If you're that kind of uh, scientist, uh, you know, a neurosurgeon or something like that, um, then you can actually look at their brain and see what it's like. Or you can actually just look at a brain and not a person, right? Just somebody who donated their brain to science and you can look at that. That's also a case study, okay? Einstein's brain is preserved. Einstein is considered one of the, uh, you know, most important geniuses, right, uh, that uh, has ever lived. And what made him different? They have his brain preserved and people have studied his brain. That's a case study, okay? Something rare, right? A genius at that level. Uh, you can use case studies as counterexamples. You can get, demonstrate an exception to the rule, okay? The uh, detailed description of a single individual. So for the most part, research suggests that, uh, you know, that if you eat healthy, you exercise, take care of yourself, go to the doctor, right? Uh, you'll live longer. But there are people who are counterexamples. There are people who beat the odds. There are people who smoke and drink and eat very badly, right? Very unhealthy diet, never exercise, don't take care of themselves, don't really go to the doctor and still live a long time. What is it about those people? You can study that one counterexample and see what it is about them that protects them, that helps them live a long time. It's probably their biology. And here are the uh, summary of the strengths and weaknesses of the case study design, which I won't go over again. But that is it, you guys. I'm going to stop recording.